thorium, plutonium. So a lot of people died of cancer rather quickly or other very sad causes uh, that radiation, large exposure amounts, uh, presents to the body. And one of the things that was really interesting was a study that was going on then. And they were studying the effects of the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what they found was that there were certain people that were exposed to radiation at a very close, almost ground zero level in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that had very little genetic damage and overall serious damage from radiation and po radiation poisoning. And then there were people uh, far, far, uh, farther away that had serious damage, more so than the people up close. And they were wondering, well, how can people far, be far away have a, you know, a serious problem with radiation when some people, not all, didn't have much of a problem at all with radiation up close, the ground zero. So we began to do studies on that, and we found out that the people that were not harmed by radiation had large amounts of electrolytes in their bodies. And electrolytes uh, primarily uh, reside in the brain, and they act very much like the electrolytes do in a car battery, for example. Electrolytes are chemicals that, when stimulated, uh, ionize amongst themselves, producing electrical charges. In the case of the human brain, this ionization is uh, uh, produced when the synapses fire during the thinking process, which then sends electrical signals down through the spinal cord and other parts of the body. And any time electricity moves through anything, whether it be a wire or a nerve or an axon, it produces an electromagnetic field as a, at a per perpendicular angle, which then causes a... Um, somewhat of a protective field to be around whether it be a wire or a human being. In the case of a human being, the protective field will absorb the radioactive ionizing radiation and actually curve it and bend it into an electromagnetic radiation that the body can absorb without producing free radicals. Free radicals are what are produced in the body from radiation and other forms of poisoning, which then cause things to happen in our body which can then cause cancer and other you know, infectious and not very nice diseases, which we'll get into a lot of this later on in the up-and-coming shows, but the first show or two that I'm going to do here on this network will be just about my background so that you can understand, because I'm sure a lot of you out there have had strange backgrounds like I am, not probably all of you, but I'm sure there's plenty of, of you, and if you hear one more insane person on a microphone, it might ring true to you and might help you in your daily cause, too, to make life a little bit better. That's hopefully what we'll accomplish here. So anyway, when we did these studies, we found out that there were large amounts of foti, ginseng, and gota-cola in the diets of these Japanese persons that were not having a problem with radiation. So in later years, what I was able to do myself is formulate trace minerals and mineral formulations because I saw a huge deficiency in this country of nutritional things that were very, very important for the human body. And trace minerals, your body is, in case you don't know it, your body is 5% mineral, which controls 95% of your metabolic functions. And unfortunately, and I mean unfortunately, what happens now is that in our diets today, we don't have the trace minerals. So if we don't have the trace minerals, what happens is we're going to have some deficiencies in our personality, and we're going to have some deficiencies in our consciousness which is exactly what we're experiencing planetary-wide right now. Anyhow, more on that later. So, I lived, my mother was going through a divorce, and and, um, and my father had actually were married twice, if you can believe that. And this strange, uh, strangeness number one for Dr. Fred. Born on second marriage to uh, same parents. So parents divorced and remarried and then I was I came along. So I guess I was a, an after effect or whatever you might say. Well, for, because of the strangeness that was going on with my father and mother, I was living a lot in Buffalo, New York with my grandparents. And in my grandparents living there, I had in my own room and it was a very quiet, beautiful place in Buffalo on Claremont Avenue. And I began to have astral experiences and I began to have my first interface with extraterrestrials, in this case people from Th Theta Reticuli, or I should say beings, from Theta Reticuli 3. And I had an encounter when I was very young. I was very much afraid of this encounter, but somehow or other I wasn't with a, a gray, an extraterrestrial gray by the name of Gokti Lokti. If you can remember that name, Gokti 
Lochte, and as best I would know, it would be spelled G-A-L-K, possibly an E, and then dash, or hyphen, T-E, dash, L-O-C-K-T-E-T-I, Gokti Lochte. And what I learned from him at that time, I realized I'm still evaluating my past life experiences, and I'm kind of, you know, it's like on a crash program to what I don't know at this point. And so he taught me the language, their language, their guttural language. And the, the grays are uh, uh, anatomical processes, a little bit different than ours. They don't really have a digestive system as we do. That's kind of been gone by the wayside because of, I guess, bad food habits. <laughs> and uh, too many meat eaters out there in the grays, who knows? And they absorb the nutrients from their skin. But anyway, uh, what Gokti Lochte taught me was their language. And if you were to wonder what the language sounds like, it would be if instead of we, we normally we breathe out when we talk from the diaphragm, try talking and breathing in. And you'll start squawking and squeaking, and you'll make all these strange sounds, something between a choking horse and a cricket, and that's sort of the sound that the grays produce. It's a very high pitched sound, uh, and that's what they actually verbally communicate with, although most of the time it's a combination of that and telepathy. And what I think it does is it amplifies the telepathic aspect of the body, these, these high-frequency squawks that they make, because that does uh, those kinds of sounds do stimulate the metabolism about anything that comes in contact with it, and it does produce a, a presentable result. So other things uh, that I was working at the University of Michigan, we are, we're working in a building that's been since torn down, and it was about six stories underground. It was called the Randolph Lab. I'm sure some of you out there that are listening to my voice will know, remember the Randolph Lab at the University of Michigan. And that's where I worked most of the time, except when I was in the classrooms in the different engineering buildings, which was at night. But on weekends, I was usually at Randolph Labs. We had a Bevatron, we had a Synchrotron, and we had a Cyclotron there. We, these are devices for accelerating heavy particles and producing an ionization or radiation process often common known as atom smashing. So I was working with atom smashers. And we were smashing atoms. And that was kind of interesting at the time. And then we used to have things called Wilson cloud chambers. It's art, kind of an archaic thing from what they have today. But Wilson cloud chambers actually recorded antiparticles during the emissions and collisions of these different heavy matter particles like deutrons that we would accelerate in a cyclotron. And it was interesting, we had these huge power supplies that went primarily with the synchrotron that we used to use for something else. I remember going up and down the stairs in the Randolph lab as a kid and noticing these huge banks of capacitors. And they, they weren't in a particular room, they were along the stairs, and you dare not fall on them. But Because the, the, a, a, a pyranol capacitor would probably look like about four automobile batteries stacked, one on top of the other with two big electrodes at the top being a plus and a minus and they hold huge amounts of electricity and imagine thousands of these things up and down the stairs all wired together and what they were doing was charging uh, huge amounts of energy measured in what's called joules and not like jewelry but joules spelled j-o-u-l-e-s and they would release at one point in time this huge amount of stored electricity into these huge coils in these underground chambers. And this was some kind of a, an attempt, I guess, to look at uh, teleportation and time travel and all the other kinds of things that these huge electromagnetic fields that they produced um, produced. Later on, I was told that this was part of an experiment that, as it got out into the metaphysical world, was called the Philadelphia Experiment. And this was kind of the studies that were done in, this, in my time, which is in the early early, 50, mid, early to mid 50s. These were experiment; these were follow-ons of the experiments that had happened to the uh, USS Eldridge in an earlier time at the different shipyards on the East Coast where it moved around. And the Philadelphia experiment, of course, probably most of you know because I explained this in my lectures around the world, started back during World War II with minesweepers coming up to Norfolk, Virginia to get demagnetized or degaussed. Because what happens when you uh, move a piece of metal in a magnetic field, it has a tendency to become magnetized. And if it's, if it's a minesweeper, which is primarily a non-metallic craft, and it starts to get magnetized, that's going to set off mines. It's not going to detect and find them and remove them. It's actually going to set them off. So they have to come up for degaussing. And what would happen is that when these ships would go through 
the area south of Florida or southeast of Florida known as the Bermuda Triangle, they would become invisible to each other on the radar even though they were in plain sight. Now, that was posing an interesting question. Why would these boats that definitely occupy space and time and had this early warning radar stuff to, to keep a, a distance and a spacing between them and to monitor themselves, especially at night so they didn't have a collision because it takes a lot to stop a big boat if it starts to collide with another boat. You just can't stop it like a car. They don't have brakes. They have many tons of mass moving. It takes a while to remove it, just to bring it to a 